Um, a little while back, we, we did this Women in Work uh, Bible study, and that led to us um, reading um, Proverbs 31, uh, the, the Proverbs 31 woman that we talked about um, on Mother's Day. Um, and just sort of offhandedly at the end of that uh, uh, session, I said, you know what, um, it's really too bad there's not a Proverbs 32 man, <laughs> right? Like if there's a Proverbs 31 woman, how come there's not a, a, a man text there? Um, there's not, and there's not even a Proverbs 31, uh, 32, I should say. Um, <laughs> but you know, I got to thinking, I guess if you really thought about it, the, the whole book of Proverbs is how to be a godly man. So I suppose if you like took the book of Proverbs and tipped it up on its end and like shook it down, you'd end up with a Proverbs 31 or 32 man. Um, and I thought about doing that. I thought about maybe doing something like that um, here for Father's Day. Um, but um, two things. One, uh, you know, I didn't want to just grab a bunch of stuff and throw it together because, you know, we all have our biases. And I'd rather work with something that God himself has put together. Uh, and two, the reality is that there is a Proverbs um, 32 st style man. Uh, he's just not in Proverbs. He's in the Psalms. Psalm 112 is something like a counterpart to that Proverbs 31 woman. So yeah, turn with me to um, Psalm 112. Um, as you are turning there to Psalm 112, I will say that um, that this would feel right at home in the Proverbs. This is this is what um, scholars would call wisdom literature um, because uh, it is all about how to live in light of who God is. Uh, it's just that it's in the Psalms rather than in the Proverbs. Um, and, and it's actually built just like that Proverbs 31 passage about, about women. Um, you'll recall, uh, if you were here on Mother's Day, that that, that, that um, talk about uh, a godly woman um, is a, an acrostic, right? It is, um, it, it's like uh, A, B, C, D. Each line starts with a new letter of the, of the alphabet. So Aleph, Aleph Beth, Aleph Gimel, um, all the way down. Um, you can't see it in English, but Psalm 112 is exactly the same. <laughs> it is also every phrase begins with uh, another, the next letter of the Hebrew alphabet, essentially. Um, and the two acrostics, man and woman here, are linked, right? Proverbs 31 says, a wife of noble character, who can find? She is worth more than rubies and diamonds. And, and Psalm 112 said, blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who finds um, great delight in his commands. Um, these two poems are um, uh, pictures of ideal men and women. Um, and so this Father's Day, I think it is important for us to look at this and think about, well, what does God call um, an ideal man? Uh, again, I think it's important for us to do this because our culture has all sorts of interesting ideas about what the ideal man is. Like picture in your head the ideal man, according to our culture. Um, my guess is it's probably a little bit like Tim Taylor from Home Improvement. Do you remember that show? <laughs> <laughs> More power. Uh, you know, like um, sports and football and... and um, uh, I, I showed my kid, do you remember, do you remember the, the, pa the part where um, he, he, he creates for his wife the ideal um, ballet and, and he, like, he, he splices together Swan Lake and, uh, and the, the, the dancers are dancing and no, how does that go? He, he describes what's happening and he splices together like drag racing, hot rod, hot, hot rod racing and football like a quarterback smashing into somebody and... Um, uh, something else, and then like each time he cuts to the the ballerina, and he goes, "The peasants rejoice, and the peasants rejoice." Uh, yeah, loves tools, loves cars, loves supercharging his lawnmower. Um, th that sort of masculine version of, of manliness is, is not just secular. Um, I just, out of curiosity, Googled Proverbs 32 man to see um, if anybody else had thought about this, and of course somebody else had. Uh, and, and here's the quote. Um, they say, he's not afraid, this Christian site, he's not afraid to get his hands dirty. He tries to change his brake pads. I don't know how trying to change his brake pads is good. That's like, I sure hope this parachute opens. Um, I packed it myself. Uh, he tries to change the brake pads, and he enjoys whittling wood, even if he's no good at it. 
Um, he looks sharp and dresses appropriately for the occasion without relinquishing who he is as his course, so he probably keeps his sideburns, tucks in his shirt, doesn't mind looking fashionable when the time is right, but let's be honest, flannel is always in. Ideal man uh, loves to whittle wood and wear flannel, I guess. You know the stereotype, right? It, is that what God calls an ideal man? Psalm 112, I think, gives us um, at least part of our answer. Here it is. Um, Psalm 112, starting in verse 1, it, it says this. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. <laughs> he starts there. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who finds great delight in his command. Um, blessed is the Lord who fear, uh, Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who finds great delight in his commands. That's the thesis statement for this whole psalm, um, right off the bat. What's an ideal man? An ideal man is someone who fears the Lord and, and delights in his commands. Um, let's talk about fear for a minute, um, because when we think fear, this is not necessarily the kind of fear that this is talking about. Um, we're not talking about like fear of heights um, or, or fear of Bigfoot. Um, when I was a kid, I got an owl magazine that had an article about Bigfoot in it, and I was terrified that Bigfoot was going to come out of our windrow and grab me up and snatch me in the middle of the night. Um, <clears throat> that, that, that's not the kind of fear that we're talking about here, right? To fear God is to recognize that, that he is God, that he is sovereign and holy and perfect and just, and to recognize that I'm just a man who's been created by his hand, right? To fear the Lord is to honor him, to revere him, to give him the respect and adoration and obedience that, that he deserves. That's what it means to fear the Lord. It's to, to revere him. Um, Robert Davidson, a, a scholar, puts it like this. This is not a negative dread in the sense of you better obey God or else. Um, but a gladly given response that recognizes that here in right relationship with God is where the true um, secret of a fulfilled life is. So the ideal man fears the Lord and is blessed in doing so. The, the second part of this verse, the parallel line of this verse, expands on what it means to fear the Lord um, in, in practical terms. Um, you're going to see this a lot in this psalm, this idea of parallelism. Um, Hebrew poetry, um, it, it, our poetry, um, instinctively, we tend to think you rhyme sounds, right? Like the cat in the hat, you rhyme sounds. Hebrew poetry often rhymes ideas, in a sense. So you're going to find quite often that you see an idea and then an expansion of that idea or a repetition of that idea. And so here's an expansion of it. Revering the Lord means delighting in, in his commands. It means embracing God's way of life and, and finding joy in obeying them. You know, some people want to paint um, the commands of God as, as these shackles that kind of keep us from being free. And yet, in reality, they are the guide rails that keep us on the straight and narrow. Um, and uh, the straight and narrow way that, that actually leads to life. Uh, so if we fear God, if we revere him by embracing his commands, then we are to be blessed. That's what an ideal man is like. Um, that's verse 1. Verse 2 shows us what happens, um, all things being equal, when we do that. 2. His children will be mighty in the land. The generation of the upright man will be blessed. Wealth and riches are in his house, and his righteousness endures forever. You know, one of the, one of the key ideas in this psalm is that walking with God, um, walking in his commands, actually makes us holy, um, makes us righteous. I mean, ultimately, it's our relationship with Jesus that does that. But as we continue on walking with him, we inevitably walk in these things, and it makes us more and more holy. When we follow Jesus in the way of the Lord, not turning or getting distracted um, from it, then we grow in goodness, in righteousness, and, and that can't help but impact your kids, right? 
When a, when a man is faithful to the Lord, when he walks in his ways, he is setting um, a godly example for his children, and he is setting them up to succeed in, in, in the world. Right? God, God works through our actions to show, um, not just by law, <laughs> but like through the way that we conduct ourselves, this is right and wrong. This is how you show respect to a person or not. Um, kids inevitably grow up thinking that that is normal and, and good. Um, so all things being equal, a godly man will set an example of godly living for their kids to walk in. You know, I can't help but think of um, Susan Zudima, who was here talking about um, the cycles of, of uh, generational poverty and uh, substance abuse. You know, as, as you grow up in that circumstance, it just keeps perpetuating itself. And people like Why Not are, are stepping in to, to kind of stop that cycle. Um, as Christians, we want to help with that. We also want to make sure that we're setting up our kids um, in, in a way that will um, point them towards success rather than um, something different. So um, when we do that, our children are blessed. Verse 3, wealth and riches are in our house. His um, righteousness endures forever. Um, now, where's the million dollar check? <laughs> no, um, God provides what we need. And God provides even more than what we need. I think many of us have experienced that reality. Um, and, and, and the psalm is going to say more about this. So just put it on the back burner for a second. Godly man reveres the Lord. His children are blessed. His needs are cared for. Then verse 4. Even in darkness, light dawns for the upright man, for the gracious and compassionate and righteous man. If you, if you just read verses 1 to 3, you might say, okay, well, if I just be a godly law-following man, then that means that everything is going to be hunky-dory for me. Um, but the reality is there is darkness that settles in on godly people sometimes. You may follow all the rules, but it's still going to get rained. You're still going to get rained on. Um, but this verse says that even then, even in that darkness, the Lord um, shines his light to light the way for an upright man. Now, um, th that's true. Um, there, there's almost, there's, there's, there, that's true, and, and that's the way that most Bibles um, translate that verse. Um, there, there is, though, another way to translate this, um, which makes a little bit more sense to me, um, because, because literally, like look at the verse, you can see it in front of you there. Um, literally, when you read it, it says it or he, it's a um, first person singular, uh, <clears throat> it, it or he rises in the darkness, the light to the godly ones. <laughs> so, so our Bibles take it that it's the light that rises, um, but it's just as likely that it's the godly one, the godly man that we've been talking about in the last couple of verses that that is talking about. Um, so I've seen a handful of commentators put it like this. He, that godly man, will rise as a light in the darkness for the upright ones, for he is gracious and compassionate and just. That makes sense to me because what we've talked about already in that, that parallelism, right? If the first part, if the second part of the verse about being gracious and compassionate is about that man, it makes sense to me that the first part would be as well and that he would rise up to be a light to those people who are around him. Which means then that the ideal man is an example to those who are uh, around him. But it's not just showing off who he is or how good he is. He's actually reflecting the character of God. Because did you catch that? Um, verse 4, it says that this man, this godly man, is gracious and compassionate. Have you heard those words used to describe anybody else? like in our call to worship, <laughs> like in a hundred other places in scripture. The Lord, the Lord is gracious and compassionate. That's like, in marketing terms, I think Yahweh should have put TM at the end of that because that's who he is. He is gracious and compassionate. If you slide your finger up to, verse, uh, to Psalm 111, verse 4, what does it say? The Lord is gracious and compassionate. 
Psalm 111 and 112 actually belong together just as much as um, Proverbs 31, because Psalm 111 is also an acrostic poem. <laughs> it's also Aleph, Beth, Gimel, Daleth, uh, as it goes down. So 111 and 112 belong together. Um, it looks like the person who wrote 112 looked at who God is in 111 and then said, let me apply that to say this is what a godly man looks like. So that you see, right, verse 3 in our 112, the man's righteousness will endure forever. Verse 3 of 111, uh, God's righteousness will endure forever. The, the point here is that Psalm 112 wants us to know that a godly man will reflect God's character out into the world. He rises as a light to shine in the darkness, not to demonstrate his own goodness, but to reflect God's goodness, right? It's, it's what Jesus said in, uh, in Matthew 5, let your light shine among men so that they may see how good God is, essentially. <clears throat> That's the central idea of this, of this psalm. The ideal man reveres God, respects him, honors him, obeys him, and reflects his character into the world. The, the godly man reveres God and reflects his character. Now from here, we're gonna see some aspects of his character. I'm gonna point you to three. Um, I'll, I'll combine a couple of here because thematically they belong together. Um, verse five, it says, good will come to him who is generous and lends freely. Skip down to verse nine. He, this man, um, scatters gifts abroad to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. That is that line again. His horn, his power will be lifted high. So the ideal man reveres the Lord and reflects his character by being generous. Right? The ideal man is not tight-fisted with resources. He's not um, concerned about uh, using his funds for his own benefit. Um, he makes good financial decisions so that he can use his resources to benefit others. He invests in people, right? It, it's, it's not just give away. There's an aspect of that, but he's also lending to people. He's seeing how he can use his money for development purposes to help them to grow. And, and in fact, um, remember back to verse three, right? Where's my million dollar check? The, the, the point that these verses make is that God gives these blesses, blessings so that they can be distributed out into the world, <laughs> right? It, it says um, wealth and riches are in his house, but then three or four verses later, it says he then takes those riches and spreads them out to the community. The ideal man then reveres the Lord by um, reflecting his character, uh, in this case being generosity. So the ideal man um, reveres the Lord, reflects his character by being generous. The ideal man reveres the Lord and reflects his character by being just. That's verse five. Good will come to him who is generous and leads, lends freely, who conducts his, his affairs with justice. The, the ideal man acts justly. Um, when, when you talk about righteousness as a concept, it can be kind of hard to to get your head around. Um, but if you apply it, you, you get justice, right? Righteousness applied is, is, is justice. It's acting with fairness and integrity. It's not shortchanging people. Um, and the ideal man then is accountable. He is reliable. He doesn't cut corners. He doesn't settle for doing things the way of the world. Um, he, he makes God's law his ethical foundation. Um, the ideal man then reveres the Lord. He reflects his character by being, by being just. And then finally, the ideal man reveres the Lord and reflects his character by being steadfast. Look at, look at verse 6. Surely he will never be shaken. A righteous man will be remembered forever. He will have no fear of bad. His heart is steadfast, trusting in the Lord. His heart is secure. He will have no fear. In the end, he will look in triumph on, on his foes. The ideal man reveres the Lord. He reflects his character into the world by being steadfast. He knows that he can rely on, on God. And, and verse 7, I think, is the real key here. His heart is, is steadfast, trusting in, in the Lord. Um, <clears throat> Our picture's idea of manhood is, is trusting in yourself, right? Is, is 
you know, flexing the problem away and, and making things happen. Um, and yes, we do prepare for contingencies. We work hard to put away money and provide for our family and get those pieces together. Um, but in the end, the ideal man is not leaning on his own strength to accomplish those things. He knows that the stock market can collapse and all those things can be lost. He knows that thieves can steal away things. Ultimately, it is the Lord that that ideal man is, is trusting in. And so because our foundation is the rock, um, we know that we will um, be secure, that we will triumph in the end. The ideal man reveres the Lord, reflects his character by acting um, steadfastly and confidently. And then the psalm concludes, verse 10, the wicked man, on the other hand, will see this and be vexed, upset. Uh, he, will, he will gnash his teeth and waste away. The longings of the wicked will come to nothing. They may seem to thrive in this world, and yet when God comes back, all of a sudden, it doesn't look so good. By contrast, the ideal man reveres the Lord. He reflects his character by being generous and just and steadfast. Now, let, let's think about this for a few minutes. Um, because the stereotype is, is certainly um, hunting, growing a beard, whittling wood. right? If you do these things, then you are a good man. Uh, it's about being self-sufficient and macho and, and strong. right? And yet, what does the psalm say? What does this psalm tell us? The ideal man does not trust in his own strength. He reveres the Lord. He relies on him in all things. He doesn't delight to do whatever it is that he himself wants, but he delights to do what God calls him to. He reveres the Lord. He reflects his character. Um, frankly, I think that our um, image of manhood in our culture is, is more John Wayne than Jesus. Um, and, and that's a problem <laughs> because in God's eyes, this is what it comes down to, revering the Lord and reflecting who he is. So, guys, if we're going to be godly men, um, then we have one job. Delight in the Lord and be like him. <laughs> Revere the Lord, reflect his character, delight in the Lord, do what he would do. Um, and, and I really do think it comes down to this, right? Like father, like son. God is your father. You want people to be able to look at you and go... Geez, he looks just like his dad. I want to honor my own father, but even more than that, I want to honor my heavenly father has, who scooped me out of my own sinfulness, my own unrighteousness, made me his own ch a child at no cost to myself. See what love the father has for us, that he has lavished upon us the opportunity to be children of God, and that is what we really are. I want people to look at my actions. I want people to look at your actions, guys, and say, he looks just like his father. So um, that means being generous, right? Using the blessings that you have been given um, for the benefit of, of other people. Uh, you know, it's interesting. I think um, Proverbs 31, it gives us some pretty specific applications of what a woman would do and we have to kind of conceptualize those to bring them into our culture. Um, here in Psalm 112, we get the concepts, generous, just, steadfast, and we need to apply them ourselves. So how do we do that? How do we be generous? Certainly, you know, we give our money, we offer um, to other people, we, you know, lend a snowblower or a lawnmower or a jigsaw or whatever it is that people um, need. Um, you know, I realized this week that Paul actually quotes this psalm to make a point. Um, 2 Corinthians 9, Paul is talking about giving support to other Christians, and he um, quotes our psalm. Um, 2 Corinthians 9, 9, Paul says, as is written, he has scattered abroad his gifts to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. That's Psalm 112. And then he says, now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. Here's the key. You will be made rich in every way so that 
you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. So the idea here is that when God gives those blessings to the people who walk with him, they receive it and then can use that to stretch it out and to be a blessing to others in the community, to be generous in every way. So uh, honor God, reflect his character by being generous. Um, honor the Lord and reflect his character by being just, right? Treat your family and colleagues and coworkers with fairness. Um, don't play favorites. Uh, if, if I'm honoring the Lord, then I'm going to, um, I'm, I'm not going to shortchange my employees if I'm the boss. I'm not going to steal from my employer if uh, my employees employer yeah that's right um, I'm going to be honest and, 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 and honorable as Jesus would be and, and finally I'm going to honor the Lord and reflect his character by being steadfast right um, not worrying about my retirement fund not obsessively worrying about um, how the world is changing around me um, ultimately God is never going to change and we are founded on him and so I'm going to act with confidence and steadfastness so that people will see that God is my father, that he is trustworthy and sure. So here's the takeaway, the thing to work on today. Revere the Lord and reflect his character. Let's pray together. Jesus, we thank you for coming into the world because really you show us what a godly man is like. Um, you are God and you are man. Um, and so, Lord, as we reflect on what it means to be a godly man, we pray that we would be more and more like you. We pray that, that you would... Help us to walk in your ways, to delight in, in your uh, commands. Jesus, we know that, that these things are the things that lead to life. They are the guide rails on the straight and narrow path. Lord, I pray that you will come alongside us and help us to walk in it. Father, for um, all of the, the men and the fathers here, I pray that, that you would help them to um, shape their lives according to, uh, according to Scripture, according to this picture of who um, a godly man is in your eyes. Lord, I pray that you will help us to receive um, your blessings as blessings to be shared with others. We pray that you will give us insight into how to act with justice in the world, on the job site, um, in retirement with other people. And I pray that you will help us to be steadfast. Lord, we, we as men feel this um, pressure to hold the weight of the world on our shoulders sometimes. I pray that you will, I pray that you will help us um, to trust you with it, even as we do our best to, to, to build into and to care for and to set a godly example for our families. Lord, thank you for the men here. I, I know there are so many who, who love you deeply and who seek to honor you with their lives. Help us in that, Lord. In it all, may we be more and more like you. <laughs> Men and women, um, Lord, I pray that we would all grow to maturity in Christ-likeness. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.